Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And so this is a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time and this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Thank you. What a wonderful message, Karina. And so she recorded that three years ago, and it's just um, so relevant today and to our topic. We're going to begin our show, as we always do, with um, a look at some of our activities as an organization, Rotary Nature Center Friends, in the past month. And uh, so I'm going to um, share my screen and tell you about um, a event which we planned for a number of months to occur on August 28th. It is our first in-person event that we had planned um, as a group and we invited many of our wonderful um, partners and collaborators, which I'll show you in just a moment. We really appreciate their um, all coming together to bring people at Lake Merritt um, some interesting environmental education views um, and to talk together. Um, so I'm going, as the day got closer, um, got to be a little bit um, nervous because <laughs> we had not done such a thing before, but I'm going to share highlights of the Shifting Shorelines program. Okay, so our um, this is our, our advertisement here for Shifting Shorelines Lake Merritt Site Exploration. And we brought, uh, we partnered with the San Francisco Bay Exploratorium, St. Paul's Episcopal School and Lake Merritt Institute and a number of other organizations. Go, yeah. Um, so we had an amazing lineup of partners, uh, as I mentioned, including the four with the logos there. Um, we had Andrew Alden from, Deep, uh, from Oakland Geology Blog, and we had uh, Janai Southworth from the um, Gulf of the Fairlands Marine Sanctuaries, um, and we had the, uh, Adrian Cotter with um, his underwater vehicle um, with the um, Lake Merritt Underwater Observatory. Clay um, Anderson came out to do some chalk art, and we had um, representatives from Segorate Land Trust. Um, we had uh, Viola and Sh um, Sharon coming out to talk, um, and we had um, wonderful support from Oakland Public Works and uh, OPR and YD to get through all of the setup. What could possibly go wrong? I was telling myself. And then on the day of our big event, we had the first big die off of fish in Lake Merritt. And it was um, actually not very evident from where we were at the dock at that moment it was happening. Um, it was, and people were just in great shock all around the lake. And um, so it was very disheartening to see this and all of us are really devastated by the ecological damage and we're coming together tonight partly out of that um, care and concern. Um, I want to share you that one of the um, people possibly in our audience on the day after um, sent me a message and said, um, well, but how did it go? 
and because you know it was just such a you know terrible day and i want i'm here to tell you that in, in many ways it went very well and i wanted to honor the people who came out and show you some of the things we did so um i'm gonna adjust my um there okay Yes, so uh, San Francisco Bay Explorium, Exploratorium brought out um, uh, their portable carts with maps and activities, tasting the water of, um, um, pretend water of Lake Merritt, different seasons. And um, it was uh, very in, in different um, potential regimes when we have climate change and sea level rise. So it was, that was really instructive and fun. Um, they also produced a climate compass for us uh, so that people could stand at this lowest point at, in the Lake Merritt um, Lakeside Park right here by the boathouse and think ahead what the level of water would be that right at that spot in the future. So um, we're hoping to um, get a, a more permanent um, climate compass here. Um, in the future. And we really thank um, Parks and Oakland Parks Rec and Youth Development for helping us um, get the, talk about it and, and kind of get the city interested in possibly having a more permanent one there. We also, um, we had the Lake Merritt Institute. They were out in uh, force with all of their uh, lake cleaning equipment um, and their gallery of things that they found in the lake. Uh, Dr. Richard Bailey, yeah, Dr. Richard Bailey gave a wonderful talk about um, Lake Merritt in the future and what some of the challenges are that we face and what solutions we might come up with. We had uh, St. Paul School provided some beautiful posters that school children have made with different themes about Lake Merritt, the birds, the um, aquatic life, the um, invasive species, uh, and also cultural um, aspects of how people relate to Lake Merritt. And there's uh, really very beautiful artwork there. Uh, we also had um, Janai Southworth, naturalist and educator and, um, and a um, nature journalist who came out and collected sam a sample of plankton and brought it indoors and projected that onto the uh, wall so that um, people could see the microorganisms, which we now know, have such an important impact on the whole ecosystem in the lake. It's something we need to understand better. So that was fun. Um, we had um, Adrian Cotter uh, from the um, Lake Merritt Underwater Observatory um, brought out an underwater vehicle to look around. And um, we can see right here the kind of the red glint in the water. What could he see? Well, um, you can find out exactly what he saw on that day by going to the YouTube um, video. The URL hopefully will go into the chat, and if not, I will send it out with the post chat um, email. So quite different in the same place, um, a year apart, or no, a week apart, really, um, a month apart. Yeah, um, it was quite different, very murky uh, this month. So um, Clay Anderson came out and I did chalk drawing with people. It's a lot of fun um, and shared his great knowledge of birds. I think one of the um, most powerful things for me was the, um, the involvement of young people who came out. These are volunteers from three high, four high schools um, in Oakland and as far out as Brentwood who came out and worked with us to test the water um, with the basic water quality indicators that are used to kind of take the vital signs of any body of water. And they were shocked and everyone was shocked to see that dissolved oxygen in the lake was less than one part per million on that day of the great fish kill. And this was not only at the bottom of the lake where often it's lower, but also at the top. So these young people were the first really, to my knowledge, who we're able to contextualize this die off with um, a low, very low oxygen reading on the 28th in the middle of the day. Um, here they are, we have Aria, Ellie and Emily. And here they are on the dock. 
And so it was a, in here we had um, news reporters coming and talk to us. Um, so it was a very sad day, but a day where people came together to share knowledge and love about the lake. And I think really something is starting because of all of the coming together around this problem. And I wanna thank all of the people who collaborated with us. I wanna thank the young people who gave one of their Saturdays up um, before, you know, at the very beginning of school and for their interest in science and conservation. So I will stop sharing now because it's time to get on with the show. And I wanna thank everyone. I wanna thank everybody mentioned in this slideshow um, and others. There was the, um, there was the um, Stop Waste came out and then there was a wonderful um, uh, display by the um, East Bay Vivarium. And there was also um, a, we had a um, pop-up aquarium but alas, <laughs> there was nothing to go in the aquarium because most of the animals were um, dead or dying. So that was that. Okay, so I'm stopping my share. And now I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Damon Tai. Um, Damon, um, it is such a, a pleasure to have you here. I know you've been working so hard. Um, you're so well known in the community. I've known Damon for decades really as a teacher at Oakland High School. He was just amazing in providing um, curriculum and encouragement to me as a teacher and to other teachers there. He works now for BioRad as a curriculum developer. He's also um, a um, co-founder of the uh, Cal California um, Center for Natural History. Providing <laughs> <laughs> it is, and you changed your website. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a whole other thing. Our URL got pulled, yeah. Yeah, but, but I found we will have it in, you can go there now, we will have it in the um, in the chat so people can go there and see the wonderful things that you do. So um, I um, think I will include a bio in the, um, in the post letter. Um, okay. And is that okay? Yep. And we'll okay. let you get on with the show. And I really appreciate your coming out. I know you've been working all day on on this problem. And I appreciate you having a longer intro because it allowed me to add two more slides to this deck. <laughs> it's been one of those weeks, but I mean, Excellent. I think everyone around the lake is feeling that right now and the San Francisco Bay. So um, with that, good evening, everybody. My name's Damon Tai. Thank you, Katie, for the introduction. And also thank you for years of mentorship around Lake Merritt. Um, over the years, I've learned so much from watching Katie bring students to the lake, what she shows them, what she does as far as long-term monitoring. These are the type of things that we need in more waterways in Lake Merritt, in the San Francisco Bay and around the world as kind of eutrophication takes place and we see algal blooms. So with that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and we will jump into the presentation for tonight. Let me just make sure that that screen share goes smoothly. Of course, it's gonna share how a presenter shows it first. And there we go. I think hopefully now you're seeing just the slide deck and none of my scrappy notes. So Katie had originally invited me over to do this talk um, months ago on a great note, which is the bioluminescence in Lake Merritt, which is super exciting. And this would be the time of year that it would just be getting. Um, and to some degree, it does relate to what's going to happen tonight because bioluminescence in Lake Merritt takes place due to algal blooms and the subsequent organisms that are on the tail end of those blooms. Some of those do cause bioluminescence. And then, as Katie brought up, um, August 28th hits and everything kind of changed. And so we were quickly talking about just doing a talk on the fish die off in Lake Merritt. And then as things started to unravel further, um, the talk's gonna be about the San Francisco harmful algal bloom or a HAB that has been going on since, you know, it's really been going on for about a month and a half, two months at this point, if you really trace it back. Um, I struggled with putting this together because a lot of the talks I do are more of like, uh, how do you put this old science lecture, kind of drill and kill, here's the points, let's walk through them. Uh, but with this one, there's no way to do that. So you're unfortunately going to have to deal with storytelling for me about what I was seeing on the ground, what I was putting together. And then we'll dip out to look at data that a bunch of these agencies are putting together in order to understand what's going on and then what steps we can take as a community to kind of build resilience against these events being more frequent in our future. Because it's going to be very hard, I think, uh, for us to avoid these in the next coming years. But over the long term, I think there are some ways that we may be able to avoid them 
for decades to come, but it's going to take a community. So I didn't want to drop the bioluminescence all the way because, damn, that's fun. So we're at least going to spend two slides there. So for those of you that don't know, um, bioluminescence, especially in marine estuaries, is a relatively common phenomenon. You see it all across the world. And I'd always been getting basically little tidbits of it from rowers and stuff in Lake Merritt for years. And I was basically just telling them, hey, when you see it, you just got to let me know because I've got to go out and document it. I at least want to see it glow and I'd love to be able to identify the organism. So in 2018, um, thanks to uh, Mandy Bliss, uh, Phil Clark and Trang, I got a tip off that, hey, we were out rowing yesterday and we saw bioluminescence. So I grabbed Joey Santori, who used to be a botanist living in West Oakland and said, hey, man, you got a kayak? And he's like, yep. I'm like, all right, you're coming over tonight. We're popping ourselves in Lake Merritt and trying to find this glow. And so this is what we saw. So when you would hit the, the top of the water, you had just these huge blue currents of light. Um, very amazing that you could see it with all the bright lights of Oakland um, around. After much digging, um, all I could do was get it down to a genera that was probably causing the bioluminescence. Going into this, I thought, you know what? It's probably like a handful of species in the world that do this. Uh, just the opposite, like it just became a, you know, a, a black hole of like, oh my God, there's so much in here, you know, hundreds of species. I tried talking to folks at UC Santa Cruz, UC Santa Barbara, and they helped me narrow it down based upon my cross key I'd done. And to be aware, you know, Lake Merritt and San Francisco Bay goes through algal blooms every time we get towards the end of summer because things are warm, there are nutrients around, especially in, you know, stuff close to the water. And so this wasn't the only organism, there was a whole bunch to choose from. Here's a couple of photographs of them. It is like a giant, amazing safari this time of year in the water under a microscope. So uh, some folks in the audience, potentially like Janai and folks like that, do this really well. I'm just here playing around. And that actually brings up a really important point, uh, which I want to um, kind of put out there is your presenter's biases. This is always good for any presenter to do at the beginning of a talk. I am not a marine biologist. I'm not a hydrologist. I'm not even an estuary ecologist by training. I'm a molecular biologist. And so... I'm coming at this from very much the amateur, the, the one that loves the thing, but maybe isn't necessarily a career person in these fields. Uh, so that's just um, important for you to realize during this talk. But I've spent about 20 years poking around Lake Merritt, trying to understand who's there, what they do, how they interact. Um, and a lot of my knowledge is piggybacked off of the decades of work, Katie, Doc Bailey, all these other folks. So my story around the Lake Merritt die-off actually starts on August 2nd. Um, I was flying out of Oakland to go work up in Corvallis, Oregon. And out, I happen to just be sitting on the right side of the plane to see this. I'm looking out the window and I see this dark channel in front of Alameda. And it kind of stretches up, goes, and it hits basically Treasure Island, Yerba Buena, and then kind of breaks apart. And I was looking at this and you can see actually streaks where boats are going through it. And I'm like, is this an oil, an oil spill? And so when I land up in Oregon, that's the first thing I'm doing. I'm checking to see, is there an oil spill in the Bay Area? I'm seeing no reports, no anything. And so I'm like, ah, I mean, it's got to be, is this an algal bloom? And my first thought is, oh no, was there an accidental release of additional nutrients into the Bay? Because you have to remember, all of the Bay communities, for the most part, our treated wastewater goes into the Bay. Um, and so the candidates here were going to be East Bay Mud, which is predominantly Oakland's stuff, and then EBDA, which is predominantly San Leandro, Livermore, Hayward, Castro Valley. And they're kind of at opposite sides of where I saw this channel. And so those were my kind of first like, uh-oh, is something going on? And here's maps of where those two are at. The stars on the previous map gave you that. EBDA is kind of uh, directly west of Alameda, or sorry, directly southwest of Alameda, where East Bay Mud is kind of underneath the Bay Bridge before you get to Treasure Island. And just to put it in context, not to point them out, because there are 37 agencies or more that treat wastewater and they end up within our San Francisco Bay system. And this is something we're going to circle back to at the end when it comes to this algal bloom. Um, so I got back home and I no longer reside right up against Lake Merritt at 1502 Alice Street. So it takes me a little more time to kind of filter my way over to the lake sometimes. So my closest body of water when I got home is the San Leandro Marina. And so I figured because I saw that and I had the impression that might be an algal bloom, I just wanted to go check there. And sure enough, when I get to the San Leandro Marina, it is this just ridiculous golden color. Photographs do this no justice. Anybody that saw this in person realizes that all your photographs just don't don't capture the color of this. I took it home, did my cross on it, 
and it matched what um, a handful of people had already identified going on in front of Alameda. I believe Waterboard is involved in this. I think Janai was probably also involved in this. And this was an organism known as Heterosigma Akishiwo. Um, seen it in San Leandro, I thought then in the back of my head, uh oh, is this going on in my beloved Lake Merritt where I've spent lots of time looking at organisms? And so on August 10th, I planned on going up there. In the course of meeting people during this event, I bumped into a fellow Harvey Castro who lives around the lake, who's a photographer. And he, bless his heart, was out at Lake Merritt early in the morning and captured it when it was first coming into Lake Merritt. So what you see here is that golden mix, kind of the cream versus coffee look. This is that algal bloom entering Lake Merritt at 6.43 in the morning. I'm a, a, a late sleeper, I guess, compared to Harvey. So I did not get to the lake until about 8.30 a.m. So remember, not too much long after. And it's completely well mixed, at least by the Green Bridge, which is my usual jump off point for Lake Merritt. Um, I take a, a, a dip there of water into a sample, not myself going into the water. Take it back. Also get my cross to be confirmed. Yep, this is also heterosigma again. And then that starts me thinking, uh oh, what do we know about this organism? Actually, before I even get there, I, I first shoot an email out to EBDA because East Bay Mud had already contacted me based upon those photos. And I basically asked them, hey, are any of you guys having a spill? And everybody was like, nope, there's no accidental releases we're aware of. All of our monitoring is not showing anything aberrant going on. And so that gets me thinking, well, what do we know about this organism? And when you dig into the literature with this, it's it takes you all kinds of places. Um, and everything from, you know, this has a potential neurotoxin similar to TTX. So if you guys are familiar with TTX, the tautotoxin, that is what our um, Tarika terosa, our Ruskin newts have in California. Um, so this, if it has a toxin, it's operating in a similar pathway to this. Um, this is an organism that is seen all around the world in large algal blooms. So the map there on the bottom are documented cases of large algal blooms of heterosigma akishiwo. And so it's basically both hemispheres in large metropolitan areas where you've got waterways with additional nutrients. Um, closer to home though, there were some really great papers from the Puget Sound that really kind of dig into what do these effects look like from this organism. And the thing that really kind of distills out of me that afternoon is that we should be expecting a fish die off with this. And so this is August 10th. But the caveat there, and this is thing that actually Katie brings to my attention through a conversation with uh, Jim Carlton, is that what we call heterosigma akishiwo might actually be a cryptic species, i.e. we've been using the same name to describe a number of different organisms. And some of these papers dig into that a bit, calling them strains. And this kind of complicates using literature research to understand what's going to go on, because we not, might not be talking about the exact same organism. And so for our bloom, I really hope that somebody is doing molecular work to help further characterize who this is and not just taking the microscopy and saying, oh, we're, we're working with heterosigma akishiwo. This is something that needs molecular work to make sure that we know who this organism is. So that same day after doing the reading and then kind of getting that uh-oh feel in my gut, I just kind of put out a small notification through some of the Facebook sites around the lake, just saying, hey, this is going on. I know a lot of folks are seeing this. If you could just keep your eye out for dead fish, because these are associated with fish kills. And to my surprise, nothing happened, which was great. So it actually fell out of my mind. I didn't think about it for weeks. In fact, kind of two weeks go by and I started thinking about other things at Lake Merritt, my other passions at Lake Merritt, which is looking at the fungal diversity. And I saw through a Facebook group that somebody had seen a mushroom at Lake Merritt that is unusual for our lake. And so knowing Katie's program was going to happen on the 28th and I needed to see this mushroom to get a DNA sample, I went, I'm going to be at Lake Merritt bright and early on the 28th to go pick up this giant sawtooth mushroom, so a mushroom we usually only see in the Sierra Nevadas and rarely see in the San Francisco Bay. And bless Oakland's heart at leaving a dead tree there for years so that these things could occur on it. Decay is a great thing. Some city parks manage this very well. Seattle does a fantastic job of decay as life as part of their as part of their parks. Oakland, I don't know if this is conscious, but they accidentally do it occasionally. So we're benefiting from this. On my drive in. I got an email from Timothy uh, below to the CLFM group saying, hey, there's something weird going on at the lake with dead fish. And I kind of got this feeling in my stomach about that original August 10th literature dive. And so when I got to Lake Merritt, I grabbed this mushroom where Brooklyn hits the, the shore and then walked over to the shore right there. And that's when I 
first kind of realized what was going on. That shoreline was already kind of littered in our yellow gobies, of uh, a dominant fish in Lake Merritt, originally from Australia. And then I went, oh, uh oh, uh, how, how widespread is this? So I go down to my favorite spot, the Green Bridge, and this is what I see. I mean, we're getting to the point where in places there feels like there's more fish than grains of sand. It's mainly yellowfin goby on the morning of the 28th, but there's there's other big critters there too. Uh, you know, striped bass are already starting to die. Green crabs are dead. Uh, there's anchovy there, the one off like on the lock open jaw. There's the first flatfish I've ever seen up close in Lake Merritt. I know Adrian has seen one before with his open ROV device, uh, but this was my first like chance getting to see one. In fact, the really sad thing is I'm somebody that spends a lot of time at Lake Merritt poking around. I saw a handful of species that day that I'd never seen at Lake Merritt. And this is something that kind of plays out through the course of the day as I'm walking around the lake is all of these people are just stopped in their shoes looking at the lake going, first of all, Oh my God, a bat ray. Oh my God, fish. And then it kind of, then it kind of hits them what's going on that they're dying. Um, and so it's just this kind of like mass tragedy as it kind of ripples through the community. So after the green bridge, I decide I need to figure out how widespread is this. So I start my walk around the lake and just kind of taking iNaturalist observations along the way, basically taking my cell phone, taking a picture of dead fish when I see them. And not every dead fish because I wouldn't have got out got out of there for weeks because there were so many, easily 10,000 dead yellowfin gopi that morning. But what occurs is it's the entire lake. It's entirely ringed with dead fish. And so I think it's really important that you see how they are dying because this is what's going what's playing out also in the San Francisco Bay. So what we're seeing here are these are yellowfin gobi that are trying to get air. So they're up at the surface trying to pull oxygen down and if you, as you pull back, you find all the ones that haven't made it. So these are all the ones that have already suffocated. And there's another group of them trying to breathe over there. Also in the Glen Echo Channel, we're seeing all of the large organisms back in there. Because my assumption is that dissolved oxygen back in that corner must have been better that day than in other places. And that's partly, I think, due to the way the algae flowed in. I think it flowed into the kind of the Embarcadero arm out to the boathouse first and then came into Glen Echo second based upon talking with Harvey and Katie, I think some of your folks may have also mentioned that too. So here's one of the bat rays in Glen Echo. Bat rays don't do this. They don't hang out at the surface. This one's trying to get air. It is suffocating. Um, this is one of the hardest days I think I've ever ever had in Oakland, um, seeing all this um, death um, in Lake Merritt. Around noontime, um, I really wanted to go spend the rest of the day with Katie's event because she brought in so many cool uh, presentations and groups to talk about the dynamics of our waterway and of Lake Merritt spe specifically. Um, but then I just couldn't because I needed to kind of see what was going on. But and the one piece of data I really wanted was what was this, which Katie sent out to me, I think, at noon. And this was a dissolved oxygen reading that, that um, she or the students did. And what we see is our dissolved oxygen is practically zero at this point. It's way beneath one, at least in this reading that, that was sent out to me. And you got to remember, like under 5 ppm is stress for most aquatic life forms. Below 2 ppm from a USGS point of view, this is officially now a dead zone. And so on this day, Lake Merritt, as far as we can tell, a good portion of it was dead zone. Um, and that's why we're seeing all these fish dead out there. Um, people use different uh, metrics on the backside of this or descriptors. So one, just so that you know, this one milligram per liter is uh, effective to one ppm uh, dissolved oxygen because USGS will use one uh, milligram per uh, liter in most of their readings that we'll come up to later. So August 29th, well, actually, I didn't put this in there because I didn't have time. After I saw Lake Mirror, my first impression was, crap, how widespread is this? So I went out to where the channel meets the estuary between Oakland and Alameda. Yellowfin goby also out there gasping, a few of them dead. I go out to where Bay Farm and Alameda connect, and I find dead marine worms there, dead polychaetes. Uh, I don't find any dead fish right away, but talking to fishermen, uh, a couple of them point out some dead stripers that were already showing up there. So this is my first indication that maybe this just isn't Lake Merritt and something else bigger is going on. But at that point, I've run out of time for the day. August 29th, I roll back. And now that entire Glen Echo section where all of the big boys went, all the stripers, all the bat rays, 
they suffocated that night. So you got to remember algal blooms, at least when they're first getting going, anoxia is worse at night because all of these organisms are, that are photosynthetic during the day, they're doing cellular respiration during the day, but at night, they're no longer doing the photosynthesis. So they're not pumping out O2 into the water, but they are gobbling it all up. And so you have a full, full drop back down to very low oxygen levels. In a very small walk between the cathedral and Lake Chalet, I counted 522 dead stripers. 522. This is a small portion of Lake Merritt. I, di I didn't have time that day to walk the rest. I had like work commitments. 39 bat rays. I think the most bat rays I've ever counted in a single day at Lake Merritt has probably been, you know, under like around five at best. Uh, this was, was huge. And then small fish still in the tens of thousands. And what we're seeing now is instead of just yellowfin goby, we're seeing some of our other small fish get caught up in this die-off, things like anchovies, things like smelt. I come back on August 30th, and now is the large die-off of the anchovies. Um, so on the 29th, there were still anchovies kind of swirling around places and smelt, and they were mainly going to where water was still coming in through some of the drainages uh, by Glen Echo and even just uh, through some of the surface street uh, runoff. Um, that's because that water was still oxygenated when it was showing up, and they were able to use that. By August 30th, all of them are dead. I no longer really see schooling fish over in Glen Echo, uh, but I do find just thousands of smelt and um, anchovy dead. And now the another disturbing thing to me is I'm starting to see the shellfish open up. So our Japanese little neck clams are open, our mussels are open. The bottom of the food web is basically unwinding in front of our eyes because we've been anoxic for so long at Lake Merritt. So that night I go home, I start an iNaturals project, but in my brain, I'm still just thinking about Lake Merritt because I haven't gone out to the rest of the bay yet. In fact, I don't, I don't even have a good pulse that this is going on big, big time in the rest of the bay. So I start this project thinking that people just kind of will start participating around the bay. Maybe we'll see some other stuff going on, but I never thought it would be the impact that it would as far as the die-offs around the, around the uh, bay. So I think I get that project built at like 2 a.m. in the morning because it's just one of those nights. And by 8 a.m. I wake up and there's already 100 observations coming in from all over the bay. And I go, uh oh, this is really big. And by today, we're well over 1,000 observation. 440 of those are sturgeon. And we'll dig into that a little bit later. And this is not just Oakland anymore. This runs from Napa County all the way down to Santa Clara. There's no part of the bay that is not touched by this, i.e. dead fish rolling up on shorelines. This is huge. But what really happens, I think the, the heroic thing here is the number of people that kind of pick up the torch and say, I want to go out there and make sure that we don't miss something. I want to go out and observe. And so, so many people jumped in and got out there with their cell phones, the iNaturals app, and started recording what was going on. And the beauty about iNaturals was that people could see where other people have been because there was data points there. And so I had people constantly texting me saying, hey, where can I go? Through Instagram, through text, through Facebook, what, all these social media things. And I could go on there really quickly and say, hey, it doesn't look like anybody's looked here. Could you go there? And this is what allowed us to get this really quick coverage. I mean, I would say by day two or day three, we've basically pulled in most of the San Francisco Bay counties uh, as having dead fish at this point. Uh, just to give a feel of what we're seeing right now in the data, at least 73 species of dead things involved um, all across the Bay, over a thousand observations, over 130 people involved. And literally, if I when I get done with this, if I, if I go back in that project, there'll be more observations and more things still rolling in. Luckily though, we're seeing the ebb of all the dead stuff Kind of slowing down as the oxygen levels around the bay around lake merritt kind of get better but the reason i kind of highlight some of these organisms is just to show you it's not just fish the focus for many people is fish because they've got strong personal connections with them they can relate to them more right a lot of people don't relate to like those beautiful polychaete worms down the bottom corner but all of this entire food chain is getting hit by this low oxygen event caused by this algal bloom and potentially by a neurotoxin um, with this algal bloom, but that is still being figured out. Water board and some other agencies are doing testing to figure out, is there a toxin involved with this specific bloom? So they've taken fish samples, they're looking in their tissue and they're looking in water samples. Um, let's talk about the sturgeon die-off because this then is why this becomes not just, you know, oh, some, some invasive species are dying off in Lake Merritt. We'll forget about this. This is what brings in agencies is when 
threatened or endangered fish start dying off and ones that are really big from a recreational point of view as, as well. So red or um, sturgeon, if you're not familiar, are these really large decades old fish. And a lot of the ones that rolled up during this event are big ones, four to seven feet. This is not a small fish. So the photographs there at the right, these are, I think this was the 29th or the 30th, or probably the 30th when I went up to work. And so these are just like out in front of my work um, in Hercules, California. Um, they don't hit breeding age until they're like somewhere in their mid teens, which means recovery time for a massive population die off, like what we just went through, is something I can't even imagine. But I hope CDFW is able to put numbers to that because this is something, this is a fishery we've now got to really watch, especially if we anticipate having more of these HABs, harmful algal bloom events in the future. These organisms are also just historically very old. So you can find fossil record of them in the Cretaceous period, right? Cretaceous period, let that sink in, right? Way, way back. These are ancient organisms, at least from a body plan. I'm sure evolution is still having effects. We just can't see some of that evolution because it's too small. This map on the left here, this is where all of the dead sturgeon were found. So as you can see, it's all across the San Francisco Bay and even a couple stretching out a little bit into the Delta a little bit into the Delta, but the Delta seemed protected. Um, the bloom didn't seem to come out there and kill uh, sturgeon, which is good. Let's dig into the two species we have locally. We've got the white sturgeon, um, which is um, probably the best known one because it's the one fishermen can go after um, in the Bay. It's also North America's largest freshwater fish. So these can get up to be 14 feet in length and up to 1500 pounds. Um, the oldest known one um, is 103 uh, years old. They predominantly stretch from kind of San Francisco Bay up into the Pacific Northwest. Um, and what you see here on the right is actually on the Columbia River at the Bonneville Dam outside of Portland. There's a great white sturgeon display where they've got this just beautiful, massive Herman the sturgeon that you can go visit if you ever come through the Columbia Gorge. But they're just amazing, magnificent fish. I mean, they're really kind of like the redwoods of our waterway. They're these old things that when you see them, it just changes your relationship to that space. Cause you're like, I can't believe this thing lives here. It just is, it's almost hard for my mind to be wrapped around how big, how ancient these critters are. And then the one that really gets the feds attention is the green sturgeon. And that's because it's on the federal um, protected species list. Um, these get up to about seven feet in length, about 350 pounds. Their geographic range is about the same as the white sturgeon. So from kind of the San Francisco Bay up into the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they're differentiated due to their smaller size um, and the fact that their coloration is green. They have uh, scutes, the kind of uh, bony things on, on the exterior that you can easily see in different locations um, than the white sturgeon. And then also their fin ray count is a little bit different but we had at least 14 of these come up during this event dead. This is a big deal because there's already not many of them. If these events continue to take place, I don't know if the potential for localized extinction might happen, but it was something that I would at least be worried about. And I know CDF is worried about. So like I said, a lot of people, sturgeon are the things that kind of pull them in because some of us have some very long personal relationships with them. And I'm one of those people. I didn't grow up in the San Francisco Bay. I grew up in Calaveras County. Probably none of you know where that is at, unless you read uh, Mark Twain a lot and you remember the uh, jumping frogs of Calaveras County, basically two guys getting drunk in a bar and betting whose frog could jump fastest, which was a big portion of my county's income for years going forward. But I would come down and I'd visit my grandpa Jim in Stockton, California, which is of course ultimately connected to the Bay through the estuary system and through the Delta. Uh, Grandpa Jim was OBGYN, but in his spare time, what he loved to do is go fishing for stripers. Um, in the process of catching stripers, he would occasionally fish for sturgeon, um, not to bring them home, necessarily put them on the table, but to kind of just get to see them. And so I think this was the first sturgeon I ever caught. And I think that same day, I think we ended up pulling up one of those just mammoth ones. And it completely changed my view of what was in that water. And this is one of those things that I think is in danger of future generations not being able to see. And this is why we need to really rally behind what caused this event? How do we prevent eutrophication taking place throughout our Delta system? Because our, there are algal blooms right now going on in Stockton, and we've got the, this big one going on in the San Francisco Bay. 
So this almost wraps up my story time about my my experience with it. On September 3rd, um, throughout this, this week now, I'm continuing to try and get out and just survey as much shoreline as I can. But by September 3rd, remember, this isn't much, this isn't many days out from when the initial die-off start. Fish are decaying so fast that it's really hard to see them. Remember, like many foot-sized fish, and it's getting hard to see them. The only thing I'm able to find a lot of times now are these massive skulls from sturgeon. So these are ones that were found out in front of San Leandro on the 3rd. Um, State Water Board puts out a, I don't want to say late, because they put out some notifications earlier too about the algal bloom going on, but then that they were worried that there might be an additional fish die-off that would start taking place this week due to these warm water events that we're getting from the um, hot period that we've all just kind of passed through. So one kind of factual piece we just need, I want to hit right again before we jump into some of the agency data and who's involved in kind of figuring out what's going on, what the effects are, how we can maybe get strengthen ourselves against these in the future is, how do algal blooms lead to O2 depletion that cause death? And there's kind of two main ways that it takes place. So during the original algal bloom, when you've got the, the organism is you know rapidly dividing, you're getting this giant biomass of that specific organism. Remember, all of a sudden, you've got a lot more organisms in the water. During the day, that's kind of you know not the worst thing because they're harvesting light, they're harvesting carbon, and they're basically letting go of oxygen through the process of photosynthesis. But then when nighttime hits, you now have all of these new community members that are also gobbling up the oxygen. And so you see these dips in oxygen at night due to that portion of the bloom. And then where it gets really bad is when that bloom starts to die and those organisms start falling down the water column. They're basically food for other organisms. Other organisms, as they're eating them, are metabolizing them. That uses oxygen, and that just causes that O2 just to kind of keep dropping. So those are kind of the two ways that these large algal blooms can lead to O2 depletions that lead to die-offs. And this is what I'm focusing on, because like this, we've got really good data for at this point. Remember, there's still the big asterisk of, is there a toxin involved in this bloom as well? So... Take home points from my observations throughout kind of the last week and a half. The major hit was Lake Merritt. Lake Merritt is kind of a canary in the coal mine for the rest of the San Francisco Bay system for a number of reasons. A, it's a smaller body of water. We already know it has O2 problems occasionally. And there's a lot of eyes on it, like that canary in the coal mine. And so we're able to see an event happen there much faster than any place else in the Bay. And just due to the flow dynamics, a lot of the dead fish don't just disappear from sight really quickly. So you gotta remember in the bay, we're only seeing the stuff that dies, floats, and then bobs its way to shore. At Lake Merritt, we're lucky that when the tide goes out there, those dead fish, we can get out on the shore and kind of see them really quickly before they vanish. And a lot of those gobies, when I came back the second day, were gone because a little bit of tide came up, picked them up. Now they're at the bottom. I can't see them anymore. So Lake Merritt, I feel like gives us a really good window onto potentially what's happening in the rest of the bay, which is, I mean, a complete disruption of the entire food chain. Um, and it really gives us an idea of how those O2 effects maybe sequentially also affect the food chain. Um, and you got to remember, this ultimately is going to affect our charismatic fauna. So a lot of people come to Lake Merritt to see the birds, right? Anybody that's been out there this week to see birds knows that this is a totally different place. Our fishing birds are not really there. The only folks that are there in good numbers have been seagulls. Everybody else is kind of left because there's nothing to eat. And this is going to be a big ripple effect going forward. Talking to people in Alameda when me and Janai and Mary Spice were out there trying to do dissolved oxygen a few days ago, people were saying the same thing out there. Hey, this is usually full of pelicans diving and there's no pelicans here. Where are they? And so my fear is that we still haven't seen all the effects from this yet. We're going to have a ripple effect as that food chain disruption goes up the goes up in levels. So that's that's birds, that's pinnipeds, our seals, our sea lions, things like that. So I really encourage everyone that's listening to have that in the back of your mind when you're going out and hanging out in the bay. See if you see unusual behavior, write it down, document it. We really want to know what this event caused because it'll help us understand it more and it'll help us understand when this happens again. And I hate to say this, this is going to happen again. We want to understand what that might look like and are there things we can do to help mediate the problems as they unfold. And I think the big thing to think about here too, and this is really hard for a lot of people, even me, um, 
is that to really to conserve those most charismatic organisms, we really have to protect the most uncharismatic ones. And I think that's a really hard thing for people because a lot of us don't really relate to marine worms. We don't really relate to mollusks, but watching them relating to what they do for those other things we really like is really important. So just to kind of highlight that, because that's what brought me into Lake Merritt was actually looking at those weirdos, because I must be a weirdo. Um, here are some of those wonderful, uncharismatic organisms from Lake Merritt that we lost in huge numbers the last week and a half. Um, and these are some of the things we want to start caring about. Extend our love out beyond the birds, out beyond the seals, extend it to everything that's in our waterways. So now let me dig into some of the agencies at play the data that they've started to share and kind of like what this means um, at a big at a big picture point of view. And remember, once again, not a marine biologist, not an estuary ecologist, molecular biologist training here talking. So if I misspeak, please somebody feel free to say, hey, Damon, I think you're wrong about that because you know what? Having humility and being able to say, hey, I don't know is the biggest thing in solving most problems uh, that we face. So involved in this has been a handful of agencies and players. I just want to Shout out to a couple of them that have been very out there in the public about what they're doing and their data. So Baykeeper, uh, San Francisco Estuary Institute, California Water Board, uh, CDFW, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, USGS, Berkeley's Department of Environmental of Environment Science and Policy, Lake Merritt Institute, uh, UCSC has been involved in this with some of their satellite data, um, San Francisco Estuary Partnership. Uh, we've got groups from Davis involved, and I apologize, Cal Academy and iNaturalist. I dragged you into the mix by using iNaturalist to document this stuff, but it's really a great tool uh, to bring in the public and allow us to help these agencies see what's going on with one of these events. So one of the big players, and, I, and God, this brought me back on Twitter. I haven't been there in like four or five years. I tried to stay away from that dumpster fire, but... It is really the place that a lot of this data gets shared really quickly. So I went out, went back on there, and these are some of the folks that were really helping out. Uh, so dissolved oxygen, uh, Keith with USGS, got some probes out the San Mateo Bridge and the Dumbarton Bridge relatively fast considering what was going on. And this is some of the data, and I just pulled these literally while Katie was giving you guys the intro. So if you've got the latest updated information, so you can see there that as we're coming out of when we saw the kind of fish die off at Lake Merritt, that we see the San Mateo uh, data drop down into the dead zone. Same thing with Dumbarton. Um, but as we progress towards today's date, we're slowly rebounding, which is great, right? We're not staying in that dead zone for an extended period of time, but we were still in that dead zone for a really long time for organisms down there, right? They are, a lot of them are dead and we just can't see them unless somebody wants to get open an ROV down there and poke around. But the shining light is that we are coming back up. Those O2 levels are getting back up. I would say just within the past one or two days, we're kind of getting out of that stress zone. So above five you know, parts per million. Uh, this data is all publicly available. So you can go there and watch it on your own. You can just go pull it from uh, Keith's Twitter uh, feed. The other one that Keith uh, shared, shared, and I think this is coming uh, partly out of some of that UCSC uh, data mining, um, was this visual of basically chlorophyll from satellite images from the start of August through the end of August. And I think this actually really helps paint a really good picture of how the algal bloom progressed. Um, and remember, with this type of data, we can't say, hey, that's heterosigma down there because you got to use a very different lens. It's much closer to see that. But it can let us know hey, there was a massive growth in organisms that were absorbing where chlorophyll, where kind of phytoplankton absorb at. And what we see is 8.3, right? This is pretty dang close to when I was taking that flight. And right there in front of Alameda, I see that bright red line. That's what I saw in the water. This is always nice when you have uh, data that reconfirms what the other one saw. And then as we progress forward, and actually let's do this first. We see that line in front of Alameda. Also, let's look down in the South Bay. The South Bay is really known for having um, blooms kind of yearly anyway. And so we definitely see that going on down there. And we see a little bit around the edge of the North Bay. And then we see this kind of accelerate over the course of the month where it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Remember, fish die off at Lake Merritt is the 28th. 
I would say somewhere between, you know, 822 and probably, you know, 829 is kind of the peak of the bloom experience. And this is probably where we're getting those major kind of anoxic cyclings at night. And as we kind of move probably from the 26th out towards the 30th is where we're getting the um, oxygen drops from these organisms now falling down the water column, other things gobbling them up. But we can really have now a strong idea of how this plays out in the San Francisco Bay system due to uh, this visualization. Um, but now the big question becomes, well, what the heck caused all this? Because man, none of us want this to happen again, right? So what caused this? San Francisco Bay Estuary, it's not like a simple like billboard, uh, you know, billards board, um, Newton sort of physics question of like, what are my handful of variables and how do they interact? The number of variables is staggering when it comes to biological activity in the San Francisco Bay. So there's all these things to try and manage, right? And so what a lot of folks have done during this, including myself, is just trying to be like, well, what are the biggest ones? What are maybe the biggest drivers that we think are involved here? Let's focus on those, do some deep data dives and figure out what's going on. Because remember, we're, we're in climate change. We've seen temperatures go up, right? We've all talked about uh, sea surface temperatures in the Bay and things like that that are abnormal. We know we've been in droughts. We've got less fresh water coming down through the Delta system, which also means we have less particulate matter coming down through the Delta system. The decrease in particulates in the Delta can increase algal activity because all of a sudden there's not particulates blocking out light getting further down into the water column. Um, but the kind of the big one for I think everybody is probably nutrients. And that's because we all know that we've been playing on a fulcrum for a really long time in the San Francisco Bay. In fact, I would say that's really important in this because we know talking with all the different agencies, there are no obvious signs of an anomalous release. Remember, these agencies are really good about reporting this because there are big fines associated with them and they are very good at controlling what goes on or doing their best to control what goes on out of their pipes. This paper here on the right, which was published in, two, I think it was submitted in 2019, but actually gets published in 2020. This paper more or less predicts this event. So I'm just gonna dig into a few pieces of this. Um, graphics on the right. Uh, we're actually, let's start talk about the data, how they, how they get this data. So these are, it's a long multi-year study of multiple data points across basically the Delta, coming all the way out through the San Pablo Bay, going all the way down to the South Bay, and basically looking at all of these factors that we know are involved in potential algal bloom behaviors. Um, and a lot of this is the nutrients. So nitrogen and phosphorus are the big players usually when you talk about nutrients, just like the plants in your garden, right? If you're trying to get good plants, what are you usually trying to make sure your soil has? Lots of additional nitrogen and phosphorus. It's the same thing in the base system for algae. What they want, nitrogen and phosphorus readily available. So if we look at the graphs on the right, the top one there is nitrogen levels in many different um, water systems across the world. And a lot of these, if you look at them, these are ones that you probably read about having algal bloom events, right? Tampa Bay, Chesapeake Bay, look at how low they are to San Francisco Bay. And then let's go down to phosphorus. We see the same thing there. And so the thing that you can quickly glean without going into all the details of this paper, because there's a lot of gems in this paper, is that we have been playing up at an upper limit with nutrients for quite some time, and it's surprised that we have not been burned yet. And so I think this is why when you kind of listen to a lot of the agencies right now, a lot of the focus is on the nutrients as being the big, the big highlight. Um, in conversations with folks, just kind of put some numbers of where these nutrients are coming from. 60% is through wastewater treatment. 15% um, appears to be coming down through the Delta system through agricultural runoff. And another, you know, somewhere around 15% is coming out of, you know, all of our yards, urban runoff, things coming off the streets and ending up in the Bay. And so if we're going to tackle this, you always go for the biggest chunk of the pie first, right? Which is that giant 60%. And this paper actually kind of like, I think things were already moving that direction. Agencies were already moving that direction. There are already big studies going on, even ones estimating how much is it going to cost to get us back down below a bunch of these other uh, values. And so right now, I would say, we just went past that tipping point for the San Francisco Bay. And we think that it's the nutrients that are having this effect. So how do we get these under control? Um, well, what can we do for Lake Merritt first, right? 
that's what brought me into this. It's not because I'm out at the San Francisco Bay. It's because I show up at a place I love and everything's dying. Well, one of the things we can really do for Lake Merritt, I think, is reinvesting in understanding the dynamics of Lake Merritt. Just like the San Francisco Bay, the number of variables that go into dissolved oxygen, nutrients, all these other things that are going on at Lake Merritt are really complex. And we've got okay data sets on them. LMI, Katie, you know, Merritt called, a bunch of people have been kind of pulling what they can in order to do stuff, but it's all out of amateur love, that love. And when I say amateur, I mean this in the best way. I'm an amateur at Lake Merritt. I'm one that loves this place and wants to see things happen. We don't have a lot of funding around this. And so there really needs to be some more funding that comes in to really study what's going on at Lake Merritt, because this is what's going to allow us to make educated decisions about how do we modify this waterway or what do we do with this waterway in order to avoid these events in the future? One of the short-term things we can do is invest in the current oxygenation of the lake. So the lake has, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt because this is all just really gripping, but um, we're going to need to take a few minutes to have our formal end of hour. And then if you're available, would you be able to stay after eight to have Q&A and Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I want to say thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. And um, thanks, Damon, um, for just a fabulous um, lecture. And we're going to continue after eight o'clock for everybody who can continue. Um, We are recording. And the show will be rebroadcast on um, KTOP Channel 10, the City of Oakland's uh, TV channel um, on Sundays. In the first two Sundays of a month, um, they broadcast uh, the uh, past shows, a selection of past shows. And then um, on the last two Sundays, they will do the current month's show. So this one will be coming up um, soon. Um, We have other important events we'd like to let everybody know about. Um, And one is, of course, uh, Creek to Bay Day is coming up on September 17th throughout Oakland. And this is an opportunity to actually remove some trash and nutrients from the lake to help reduce the uh, the problem. So I know the LMI is doing a a cleanup and many other organizations are doing cleanups on Creek Mm -hmm. to Bay Day. We will have our third um, weekend cleanup um, at the Rotary Nature Center grounds, meet at the Totopal at 10, and we'll go on till 12 or beyond on that. Um, October 12th through the 14th is the Autumn Lights Festival at the gardens at Lake Merritt. Please check that out. Wonderful um, tradition and a wonderful program. Um, And you can go there to find out um, how to get tickets. On October 14th, we're going to have our next Lakeside Chat, number 23, about river otters. And uh, it will be presented by Megan Isidore, co-founder of the River River Otter Ecology Project. Sorry about the typo on that. And um, she was unable to come on the first Friday, as we had originally invited her, uh, because she's presenting a paper on uh, otter spotting um, in to the um, ICUN in um, Paris, I believe. So she couldn't make it for that first Mm -hmm. Friday, but she will be there um, and it's going to be a wonderful program. So please uh, check that out. We want to thank our donors um, and we'll give you information. We are a nonprofit all volunteer organization and um, we depend on um, your donations to help provide equipment and um, uh, various uh, tools and so forth for doing our public education programs at Lake Merritt with young people and with adults. So um, we have, we'd like to thank our producer, Rob Lamone, um, Bob, um, <clears throat> David Wofford, and I are the co-chairs. Kirsten Furman did uh, his art and design and has done some uh, wonderful um, work for us this last month with the um, shifting shorelines and other uh, things. We have uh, Dr. Janice Lord Walker, Betsy Schultz, Patty Donald, and many other NCF volunteers. If you enjoy what we do, please um, think about giving us a donation. You can go to our website and do so. We have somebody's hand raised and uh, Nick will get to you very shortly on that. Um, So um, here's what our webpage looks like and there's the donation button.
um, we are um, primary stewards of Lake Merritt Wildlife Refuge. We regularly host um, school groups and members of the general population um, on a variety of activities, um, getting to know the lake and be good stewards of the lake. And I believe that leads us to one of our um, most recent um, programs we had at our um, <clears throat> marsh, at the Sailboat House Marsh. Uh, we've got lots of students out to help weed and plant. And I think that brings us, we do microscopy with them. Um, it's possible to collect a plankton toe and um, see critters. And some of these critters we saw in this particular um, shot were the heterosigma itself. So uh, again, we want to thank everybody for coming and uh, bring our program to a close. Let's um, have everybody give a round of applause for Damon and then we're gonna reopen so that we can continue um, the discussion. So let's everybody, we'll go gallery here. Let's everybody um, have a clap. Thank you so much, Woo! Damon. This thank you, Damon. Amazing. Fantastic. And now we're going to go to speak. Hey, Damon. Damon, we have a, you have a few more slides, right? Yep, I got about four more slides. So I can be relatively okay, quick with those. Let's go there and then we'll open it up to conversation. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Go let's do it. that. So what can we do at Lake Merritt? We already kind of hit that first point about how we should be investing more in understanding our own systems so we can make informed decisions about how to manage the, the life that is Lake Merritt and all, all the organisms that depend upon that. Um, in the short term, there's definitely investment in our current oxygenation systems that could take place. Um, and the, the fountains are okay, but they don't, they don't do the full need of what Lake Merritt really needs. They only do about one acre each, and the lake is 43 acres of water. Um, mm -hmm. So they are helpful. <clears throat> they make little zones, right, especially in places where we know there was low oxygen. Uh, so that things can congregate there, but they're not something that's going to overcome an event like this um, at all. They can just make little safe spaces for some of those critters to go to during events like this. And I think one of the other things that's kind of uh, I've seen, I remember I'm not on the agency side, I'm not in LMI, things like that, but just an outsider, I'm kind of looking around like, are all the groups talking to each other? I almost feel like there needs to be like an emergency department mentality set up for Lake Merritt. So when an event like this happens, there's an easy chain of command so that thing can happen really quickly. People can get the data they need and then make decisions about what to do in order to avert the crisis continuing. Um, on the data side, Doc Bailey shared this fantastic system, I think, to model. And so this is the Elkhorn Slough. This is, there's a, a number of agencies that help fund this, but there's a lot of volunteer effort that does this. And this is a continual monitoring process over multiple years, multiple positions through the Elkhorn Slough, where you can go and you can see exactly what all of these water quality factors are that are taking place there, which then, right, you can understand what your system goes through and where things are potentially problematic in order to make informed decisions about how to manage that waterway for its best health and for the health of the organisms. And so if we're looking at a way to invest, I think this is a site that everybody should go take a look at and see what they've done here. So thank you, Dr. Bailey, for pointing that out to everyone. What can we do at the grander scale of the San Francisco Bay? Uh, we can't all just stop pooping and peeing. That just doesn't, it's not feasible. Um, so what we need to do is get that community pressure on getting the engineering going sooner rather than later, because there are ways that we can engineer our way to decrease nutrients um, with the kind of existing systems, the way that we deal with waste. And I remember, I think San Francisco Chronicle actually put the number on it, that paper before put a number on it. We're looking at probably about $14 billion potentially needed of upgrades of all these different facilities to get beneath this level that some of these folks think we need to be in order to minimize the chance of these events happening again. So the hard part there is when you see a big dollar value like that, right? Agencies aren't gonna be like raising their hand and being like, oh, let me jump in there for that. And so we really need to pressure the agencies, the water board to say, hey, we need the decision quick because we want to get to the engineering as fast as possible <clears throat> because otherwise we're going to continue to see these events take place. And even if we got engineering started right now, we're going to see another one of these events in the next couple of years. I, I, I can feel it in my gut. However, maybe a hydrologist or an ecologist will go, maybe it's not a big deal, but I think this is coming down the pipe. Um, also, 
investment in more research of the San Francisco Bay system. There's a lot of great agencies out there already doing this work, investing more in them so they can get a better, clearer picture um, would give us more to work with. Um, and then on a personal level, think about your urban runoff. It's not a huge percentage, right? But it is still a percentage. And your day-to-day -day choices that affect nutrient cycling in general, right? And that's everything from the food you eat to your gardening choices, et cetera. And that takes a little bit of reflection, right? Because it's like, it's really easy to have a little bit of cognitive distance around this and be like, oh, it's not me. But it's all of us. We're all involved in this. And we can slightly do personal modifications to our behaviors that will at least have contributory impacts on this problem. Um, and so what I would really encourage people to do is there are agencies that could use additional public comment in order to kind of help push this to the forefront. Water Board of California has a very open ear for this. And so I would say definitely reach out to them, definitely reach out to the regional office. Your local city also needs to hear that this is an issue for you. Every city that touches the bay basically had dead fish that rolled up. So this is everybody's this is everybody's problem at that point. And it's all of our waste going in there. And you could also contact your local uh, wastewater system group and just say, hey, what are you guys doing? Hey, I really support you in modernizing. And agencies that could also use your public support, and that's volunteering, amplifying messaging about getting this problem solved, are those ones right above that I just talked about. It's not us versus them. We're all in this together trying to solve this problem. But agencies that weren't listed above, that don't probably need a ton of public comment, but could really use the volunteering and amplifying, are people that are doing kind of local waterway stewardship. And that is where you're at in the Bay. It could be a variety of different players involved. Learn who they are and figure out what you can do to be involved in this, because we've got to solve this problem together as a large community. How to keep up to date on what's going on with this, because it's still uh, an evolving process, right? I went back on the dumpster fire known as Twitter just so I could stay up to date and also communicate what I was seeing out there. So these are the main folks that I feel like have been putting out great public data. A lot of these work for agencies, nonprofits, academics, but they're all, they've all been very open about what's going on, what they're seeing. So you might have to go back on Twitter, sorry, in order to get really quick updates. But then also locally, our, one of our local stewards, the Rotary Nature Center friends, Katie does a really good job of kind of updating what's going on at Lake Merritt when they go out and do dissolved oxygen, things like that. Um, and you can find and get those updates um, on Facebook. And so that's kind of how I'm also trying to stay in the mix of understanding what's going on. And that's it. So um, I'll go ahead and stop my share. And if anybody wants to hang around and um, bludgeon me with questions, I will be here for that punishment. Not to scare you off, I'm actually really excited by questions because it always helps me see things that we don't know and then go think about them more. So I'm joking about the bludgeoning. <laughs> so Nick has had his hand up now for quite a while. Nick, do you want to unmute? And um, everyone can actually unmute, but please wait to be recognized to make your comments. So Nick, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Damon. That was excellent and sobering and depressing. Um, I feel like it's bringing, it's lighting a fire under hopefully many of, of us. I, I dropped a link in the chat for a bill that failed in 2020, which was SB332, which mandated all California wastewater plants reduce by 95% their wastewater discharge into public waters by 2040 and 50% by 2030. And our all of our um, EBMUD and legislators lobbied against it and shut it down. And I think it's just disgraceful. I think well, there's a huge gray water and stormwater professional community that could easily bring us into those numbers. Um, and I, I think it would be a boon to the local green economy. So just wanted to say, let's, let's, let's hold, you know, Orange County's doing it, Singapore, plenty of of precedent for zero discharge. Let's do it in the Bay. Totally agree, totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay, um, please don't be shy. Um, okay, <clears throat> Katie, uh, hi Damon. Hey David. I, just, I pulled a couple of questions from the chat earlier. Perfect. Thank you, though, for such a wonderful presentation. Mm. 
Oh, this is from Paula. And there was a question I had as well. What has been the impact on the birds? You spoke a little bit about that by mentioning that they're not at Lake Merritt. Yeah, so anybody that's been to Lake Merritt in the past week has not seen the regular players there as far as the birds go. Um, our shorebirds have kind of moved off. I mean, I think I, I did a quick check-in at the lake to take like a, a UK journalist around the lake this morning, and I think we saw one egret. <laughs> um, definitely no pelicans. And just to be honest, even the seagulls are now leaving uh, because even they're apparently not finding the things they want. Um, and so it's getting pretty sad um, as far as the birds go. And I think this, you know, I'm, I'm actually really worried about once we hit winter time, because I don't know if that food web recovers enough to support the birds that usually come through during the winter. Thank you. Um, so, you, you know, what? Uh, uh, has there been any uh, indication of birds getting sick from eating the fish that have... That's a that's kind of like an ongoing question. I know me personally, I found, I think it was three or four dead cormorants in front of San Leandro on September 3rd. Um, but from what I can tell in the data, at least in iNaturalist, I think I'm the only one that's like really seen dead birds. And so that may have been a different event taking place. Um, but I know when I saw it, I definitely got really spooked. Like, are we seeing the edge of, of a toxin maybe amplifying up the, the food chain? But since I haven't seen any more, you know, in the last like five, six days, I, I kind of feel like that that's something that we're not going to see. And I really hope that is true. Katie, uh, there's a couple of others from the chat just quickly. Yes, um, please. Sarah asks, is, is the algae at this point receding? Yeah, so when I showed you that satellite view, right, of the bay, you could see that the bloom peaked somewhere, you know, between like the 26th and the 29th. And now the bloom is like receding. Um, but remember, that's not the end of the story, right? Because as that algae dies and starts to precipitate, we have continued oxygen drops in some of those areas. Um, the South Bay looks like it is recovering from that portion of it, right? Due to USGS's data at the San Mateo and the Dumbarton Bridge. Um, but we don't have probes everywhere. So is that going on in the North Bay? Is that going on by Richmond where there was a slew of dead sturgeon? Um, I don't know. I'm hoping though, my gut feeling is though that in general, the entire system is starting to make its way out of the low O2 event. Yeah, I think, um, yeah. so we've been doing some testing in Lake Merritt, which I think Lake Merritt is such a treasure because we can study these things close up, you know, without having to go up out onto the coast, but um, we're seeing different different kinds of flight of plankton, different kinds of diatoms, different kinds of, um, of dinoflagellates that are uh, in the water at Lake Merritt right now. It's not like it was at the beginning of the show, they showed the, uh, uh, there was a picture that I took of, of, of the um, heterosigma um, that were just like floating around like tumbling snow, tumbling um, cornflakes in the water. It's not like that anymore. There, it's much more diverse. And the water, um, and we see all around the shore, um, there's um, mats of algae that are on the rocks that are cranking out oxygen, oxygen like crazy. And in some of the um, little kind of maybe protected areas, there are tiny crustaceans like um, amphipods that are there and they're alive. I think mm -hmm. we should all be out there studying this because I think there is some resilience, but clearly, you know, the mega fauna has been killed off. And there's going to be tremendous repercussions. Still, things are coming back a little bit. And and with that, let me throw some hope in there too for Lake for Lake Merritt, right? I mean, a lot of the organisms are there from all over the world, right? We've had the marine invasive you know, species talk before. Um, these are tough as nails critters, and so if a couple of them survive, they will reemerge, kind of bloom back. We just don't know how long it will take. And some of these things that are tough as nails actually survive the O2 event. So our soft shell clams, like I didn't really find many of them dead. I'm seeing siphons up every day still. Um, the Eastern mud snail, I mean, they've got kind of a different way of getting their oxygen. So they're, they're fine. They're like having a grand time with no competition around. So there are a couple of organisms that did make it through. Um, and I think things will bounce back in Lake Merritt because it's the, it's the nature of Lake Merritt, but these longer lived organisms, it's gonna be a while for us to see them bounce back. Oh, we have a uh, hand up from Mitch. Mitch, would you like to give your question? Yes, hi. Uh, thank you everyone for doing this. And Damon, thank you for everything that you have done. 
I just wanted to add uh, about the birds, a couple of observations. Um, I have started to see a couple of the wintering birds already starting to arrive in the last couple of days. Um, today, today and yesterday, I saw a, a few pie, I think they're called uh, pied Bill. bill grebes. Yeah, pied bill grebes. And then I also saw a coot, so the small black, um, the, the small black, uh, I, I guess they're related to cranes, but they, you think they're ducks anyways, uh, come uh, today. I saw the first one, one of those today. So it'll be interesting to watch those. But something I, I also found very interesting is today I actually saw a cormorant swimming around and hunting um, and I was sitting there thinking like, yeah, he's, he's not going to find anything. But I kept watching the cormorant for a little while. And to my very much to my surprise, because I haven't seen hardly anything alive in the lake at all. It actually came up with a fish. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure that's rare, but, you know, it, it, it was something. So I, I just wanted to report those things and say those things. I, I think we will start seeing the winter. I think we do start seeing the winter birds sort of late September and through uh, start to start to come in. So I think that'll be something that happens soon. Anyways, thank you again. Yeah. And, and thank you. And this is actually what you just did was one of the most important things we could all be doing right now, which is going out and making observations of what we see and then writing them down. We got to, and to be honest, it would be really nice. It's just a joint place where people could share observations and what they saw throughout this event. If there's like a storyteller that's listening to this, that's good at managing that sort of thing. This would be something very valuable to have from a scientific side. And I think also just from a community storytelling side about what this event was like, how it proceeded and how we got to the conclusion of preventing these in the future. I cannot help but interject that um, there is a place at Lake Merritt for a nature center, a physical place where people um, can share these ideas where people can be educated about these ideas and make a strong connection with the ecology of the lake over time through activities and um, stewardship. And that's one of our missions as an organization is to bring that back. I see a couple of hands up. Um, Terry and Jamil have their hands up. Terry, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. <clears throat> I'm Terry Fashing. I do work for the City of Oakland's Watershed and Stormwater Management Division. And um, here, I'll turn on my video. Sorry, it's Friday night uh, and I had the day off, so I'm not, you know, in my work garb. <laughs> uh, so let's see. My question for you, Damon, thank you so much for this presentation, um, is in terms of aeration, everything that I've been reading and understanding is that aeration is the best option for uh, bringing some more resilience to the lake. And my uh, question is, you know, is that what you're thinking? I mean, obviously we want to reduce nutrients. It's harder to reduce the input of nutrients, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, we can't uh, control everybody's behavior, although we do try. Um, uh, but we, I'm thinking that aeration is going to be the way to go. And I'm just wondering if that's yeah. what you're thinking. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's hard because there's lots of different ways we can get oxygen in Lake Merritt, right? Aeration could be one of them. Um, and it's why we, we got the fountains in the nineties. Um, I think at the time bubblers had been presented as a potential, which would actually be a better aeration system if managed yeah. than the fountains. But at the same time, Measure DD, I mean, really what was supposed to happen was we were supposed to get a lot more aeration by water entering from the bay. Because if yeah. the tidal gates are open, you get a 40% exchange of water on a single tidal cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's been happening. I know that was what everybody was hoping for, but those tidal gates got to be open and letting that thing flow because otherwise as soon as you're you know cut it you cut it down to like half the tidal gates you're now down to a 14 percent exchange and so like during mm -hmm. this event when lake Merritt is hovering around zero ppm out there in the estuary they were closer to about four at that point it's still not great it's still stress zone but you know what that's a lot more oxygen than when we had at lake Merritt, and a tidal flush would have mm -hmm. been helpful 
I gotcha. So it could be, you know, it could be a combination of those things, making sure we're getting that tidal flush that Measure DD kind of planned for and potentially having aeration as maybe a backup system for when we have a hab like this take place in the bay. Right. And uh, this ends up becoming a very technical conversation quickly, but my follow-up question to what you just said is that you you have uh, the elevations of the, the way that the tide does come in and go out, and then you have the depth of Lake Merritt, and then you don't have the mixing down the lower depths of Lake Merritt, say in, in a situation like this, where you do have um, the algae that have come in to this particular species of al algae coming in, taking up all the oxygen, you're starting to get the anoxic conditions down in the lower depths. Um, and my question is, is, has, that just seems like a, a study question, right? Is, yeah. does the water come in and, and, and if it does, does it do anything like, what are the limiting factors of that? Like what, what, what won't that solve? Right. That's my, mon that's my study question. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that's one of the things that like, I mean, Doc Bailey brought up too, right? Cause like, yeah. I wanted to my, when this was first going down, I was like, there's got to be at least something we can start putting funding to right away. And he's kind of like, well, I mean, nothing that we have really great evidence for, right? And he's like, there's some, there's some small things, but like, we really need to understand our system better before we talk about where can we put the money right now to make a difference. Yeah. Um, right. so, I mean, what I'd really like to see is like folks like yourself, Doc Bailey, folks like Joel Peter get in a room and yeah. sit down and hash out what we do know, what we want to know and then make plans around how to get that knowledge and then make actions from it. Yes, I think that's absolutely. Important. Actually, I'd like to chip yeah. in here because- Not I to pull in the two retired yeah. guys that might be listening. <laughs> sorry, Joel, sorry, Dr. Uh, <laughs> Bailey. Yeah, so I would like to interject here um, because I spent a lot of time pouring over 20 years of tide charts. And also this is daily tidal records. And also um, I think that um, what this brings up is a real need for um, greater um, monitoring of the lake and communication among the various people who uh, affect policy. Um, and that's, uh, I think, something that, um, you know, the uh, sensors that we're talking about will make possible um, and will just raise our awareness that we, that we, we do not we have not really had that monitoring. So we do have some evidence though. There was a study done 2014, 2015 that did look at um, strat that stratification with low oxygen at depth. And over a period of, um, 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 you know, two weeks or something, there would be a, um, you know, the, the, you would have a low oxygen situation. It would get resolved. That what the study did show is that keeping the tide gates closed over for, uh, two tidal cycles, uh, 48 hours, did lower oxygen uh -huh. in certain places. But that doesn't mean, that it was nothing like the bloom that we're seeing right now. This is something of a different character. And what we need is monitoring of what's going on and communication between the people who operate the tide gates and the, um, what we're seeing happening with the um, ecosystem in Lake Merritt if we want to steward it better. But, you know, I think gotcha. that- yeah, but there has been some studies done. There has some been some information in collective, but just not communicating as well. And this really just this this event just really, um, you know, made everything crumble and fall apart. Um, right. So, and we have that study, and I think it's our division that uh, it did. Yeah, conducted that study. So I have hold of that now, and. Um, yeah, we are we are diving into this. Just and Terry, one of the I was I was there when uh, that when that data was being collected and before that yeah. was actually published. There was a Lake Merritt uh, Water Quality Technical Committee, which included Dr. Bailey. It actually included me and included um, some other it included Nick, I believe, and other right. people who would get together and would look at the um, would make comments and and try to think about ways that we could steward. We need to bring that back. Um, that's something that would be very helpful in this situation, having real people get together and discuss you know, their perspectives and what can be done. So thank you very much. That's thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to, to have this discussion. So thank you. 
Um, we had Jamil who was hand up for a long time. Jamil, could you would you like to um to um unmute and talk? Hi, I'm Bonnie. This is Camille. Um yeah, the question I had, I you know, we've been talking a lot about the water quality, and I'm wondering if there was a related impact on air quality with all the dead animals. Um and if that presents any kind of health or safety risk for all the folks who are living alongside the lake, either in tents or open air. That's a, that's a tough question. I just don't think it's anything I saw an agency jump at. Um, and I'm not sure if any of the monitoring systems we have around the lake that look at kind of things that are going on you know, in the air would have picked up anything that would have come out of this event. But Katie, I, def I defer to you if you know any information. I do not on that. I don't. I've heard anecdotal um, comments about people who've been like, you know, pulling out the dead animals that they had eye irritation. There are toxins mm -hmm. that are associated with some, um, you know, some, what do you call it, red tide, um, you know, blooms and all that. But I don't think that's been investigated at this point. I mean, stinking is unpleasant, but... I don't think it is um, actually uh, that much of a health hazard, although I don't know. Uh, so anyway, I don't know either is my answer on that yeah. one. And, and we're lucky, like once again, right, that this wasn't one of these alga that we know produces a toxin mm -hmm. that gets aerosolized real easily, like what happens with the red tides red in Florida, yeah. where people oh, yeah. are like, I'm not going outdoors and I live a mile from the coast because I'll have you know bronchial effects from it. I mean, okay. We're very lucky it's not that. Or, I mean, we're even lucky that we're not stocked in right now. Their bloom of microcystis is taking place out there. That's something I don't want to be near the water with when there's a strong wind. Um, I mean, we we kind of dodged the bullet that we didn't have one of those expand quickly within Lake Merritt and the San Francisco Bay. Well, and then did you want to ask a question? Um, I guess follow-up question to that. If if the algae was causing eye irritants like in your time out there talking to people who live at the lake, like, is there anybody who's eating fish out yep. of the lake? Yeah. I saw people on the 28th grabbing stripers and taking them home. Okay. And um, then like, and so I, I, I called like my friends that are like in the medical industry and be like, who do we have to tell that people might be showing up um, yeah. from eating fish? And so I think they got the world out, word out through like public health, but it looked like there was already a message that went out before I tried contacting so, you know, people are on that um, agency wide. Um, and I haven't heard any reports of anyone coming up sick from, you know, ingesting fish during this event, which is amazing to some degree. Yeah. You gotta remember, it's not just a toxin. It's like, oh. you don't know how long the fish has been dead when you're pulling up off right. the beach and there's all these bacterial things that could go on. Yeah. I have yeah, to say so that contractor that the city brought on to clean up the fish did a very thorough and fantastic job. I was super surprised. It was impressive. Um, I want to mention, I want to give, say thank you to the water boards who have been uh, out uh, testing the water. Um, and also um, to let everybody know that uh, Rotary Nature Center Friends is doing routine monitoring for the um, uh, California Department of Public Health um, every week. Um, and they look for things like the microcystis and the um, some of the um, other uh, you know, red tide and um, harmful algae that might be there. But uh, many of these things have not been tested before in Lake Merritt. They may have been there for a long time. We just don't know. They're yeah. common on the coast. Yeah, and that's one of the things I actually forgot to bring up in the conversation. We've had heterosigma in the Bay Area since at least okay. 2002, I believe there was a bloom in Richardson Bay. And then we've seen it every year since then. Um, so it's not like this is a completely new organism that got here and now is all of a sudden having an explosion. It's been here for at least 20 years, as far as we can tell. Yeah, I would think um, Andrew Cohen um, what, and um, Brian Cole did a study of heterosigma um, affecting the, the um, muscles in the um, uh, aquatic park in Berkeley. And there was a, quite a muscle die-off, but apparently that didn't reach the point of causing a fish kill and so it was short term, but it was definitely the same organism. Um, so yep. kind of interesting. And there's a so there's I'll a gentleman go. on YouTube that samples consistently in um, what is it, airplane lagoon, uh, seaplane lagoon in Alameda. And so he's noted that he sees it yearly, but then mm -hmm. this year it just got out of control, went really big. Yeah. Just um, 
Yeah, thank you. We have other hands. Mitch's hand is up still. And I'm just, oh, Leanne. Let's see, wait. I'm going to take a view of all the people. Mitch, would you like to make another uh, question? Or maybe your hand. No, up. no, I'm sorry. I, I didn't put my That's hand okay. up. My, my apologies. Uh, <laughs> oh, Sarah asked if fishing is allowed in the lake. And that has been a much discussed question. Um, definitely, um, it's, uh, so as Terry says, no, fishing is not allowed in the lake. And uh, you sometimes get a different, um, different, um, what do you call it, um, answer from um, other agencies, but it definitely is not a good idea, um, not a healthy thing. We do have a, I'm just gonna say yeah, that there is a code uh, Oakland Municipal Code, and I'll try to find that and put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, that we have a, a oh. article about that in the tidings. I could, uh, oh. I, you might check there as well, um, because this is something that, that has been of concern to people, um, largely because of the people are irresponsible in leaving their fishing gear, leading to uh, the death of birds primarily, and you know maybe some fish and whatever that ingest it. Um, so that's a real problem. Um, and that the city ordinance does forbid it, but then the state, the California Wildlife Act does say that it is permissible. So there's a jurisdictional discussion there that I'm- I, I, Yeah, thanks for that context. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, um, a question from a Leanne, Katie, if Leanne oh, is yeah. still with us. It was in the chat uh, from early on. And it went along these lines. Her, and then I have a personal question also. But uh, Leanne wanted to know whether or not there were any um, extant species that have uh, survived the uh, algae bloom. And if, if, Leanne, maybe you can help clarify if you're still with us. And maybe she's not, but that's how I re that's how the question was worded. Are there any extant uh, species that are surviving? I mean, within Lake Merritt, I kind of already went through the the handful of of survivors that we that we had there that don't seem as effective as everybody else that will bounce back really quick. I think when we get out into the San Francisco Bay, it's a lot hard to ask, right? It's easy to see stuff at Lake Merritt. But the hard thing about the San Francisco Bay is you can't see the bottom where everything died really easily. And so we really don't have a good pulse, I feel like, on what's going on out there. We're just seeing, I mean, the tippity tip of the iceberg of this event when it shows up on the shoreline. I'd just like to say something about that and um, that um, we do have monitoring of um, invertebrates going on at Lake Merritt. We have a... Uh, uh, We've had um, the Snapshot Cal Coast um, events at the Lake Merritt a number of times. And we also had a check sheet that we went through um, the week before the big drop. And then we were able to come out and redo the same check sheet to see what had happened. Um, and I'd like to mention that this weekend, um, the um, Exploratorium is having their annual buoy day. Uh, in which they remove a uh, experimental buoy from the water and clean off all the organisms. And um, we know, because we took a bunch of students over there last year, we have a, a filled in check sheet of everything that we saw there. Uh, so I'm definitely gonna wake up tomorrow morning and get over there and just see what's growing there on the buoy this year. Um, there yeah. are people out there, I know Andy, Andy Chang is out there uh, monitoring. There's a lot of people out there monitoring and we'll have some, um, understanding of what happened to all those populations. Adrian uh, Cotter has had his hand oh, up for Adrian. a while. Thank you. Uh, thank you there. Uh, hey, Damon, thanks Thanks so much for the, the talk um, and for all you've done the past couple of weeks. Um, uh, all your Instagram posts have been amazing. Um, I was curious, like, given that people knew this was happening, we kind of knew this was happening and kind of half expected uh, a fish kill, but like, I feel like there was like a gap of like, could we have done anything about it? Could have, could we have closed the tide gates before the, uh, before the hab got to the lake? Could we have installed bubblers much earlier or done some emergency things? Because we didn't even get the, the one fountain back working until after right. the fish kill. I was uh, going to ask but, that question too, if closing the tide gates would have helped the lake at all. 
I mean, it's there's a small potential it could have, but my gut feeling is that seeing the algae flow in is already too late. You already have enough starting material there that it's going to bloom. You had to have closed it before it even entered like the estuary between Alameda and Oakland. I was thinking more more of that, more of that timing before it, before it. But then you're setting up for Katie's, but then you're setting up for Katie's problematic event, which is now you don't have that flushing either. And we end, end up in our own O2 depletion due to something else in there kind of growing and stagnating. Um, especially because at that point, right, we have no aeration taking place. There's no That's fountains was... going, there's no bubblers. Uh, we would have just created our own O2 problem is my gut feeling. That's where I was thinking that that would be coupled with other other actions. So, okay, um, yeah. It wouldn't just also, be... um, the um, tide gates are, are never completely sealed. Um, there is a um, oh, yeah, there true. is a channel that's even at the very highest high tides that still allows some water to, a bypass channel. And since we're dealing um, you know with an organism that has biotic potential, and we have a, a lake that's full of nutrients, you know, just take and a it's, little bit and boom, you're going to get the bloom. And it's 20 microns across, so it's coming in on your bird feet, oh, yeah. things like that. Oh, yeah. um, it's going to come in mm-hmm. through many many routes. Yeah, it's just that it's uh, just really sad. It's just, I think, greater understanding. Um, you know, we humans cannot fix everything. We, we need a greater understanding, but we do need to take some action that we know will work. Um, I'm, you know, I've also um, would be for having a greater understanding of how much flushing we get um, when we have high tide gates open um, and uh, how much what we could do to enhance that when because a lot of the time when the tides are closed it may be only part of the tidal cycle that's problem and if and as we now know they're improving their control if we can top the um the high high tides and allow a great amount of flushing between those high those high tides we could um improve the situation a lot if we have a little more nuanced operation with greater understanding of the um the hydrology and dynamics of the lake but we're still part of the san francisco bay and unless we're working on that i don't want to say our work is futile but it's going to be a much harder job um, in order to avoid this and so i think circling back to nick's statement which was hey look at this bill People were already aware that this is going to take place and we were trying to get momentum on it and it basically died. That's where you stop this event or at least minimize the chance of how many of these events we're going to have. Because now we're how many years behind on getting the engineering going to then bring down the nutrient level, you know, at least five, five plus years behind. Um, and so now we're going to have to live through a couple more of these before we even start to get in into the engineering is my gut feeling, sadly. Hopefully not, but yeah. Hillary O'Neill has your hand up. Thank you. Hi there. Um, That kind of segues into my question. I was just wondering about, you know, nutrient release and some of the, um, like I'm, I'm totally ignorant of all of, all of uh, how all this works, but (laughs) um, you know, I was just thinking about population growth and, um, you know, how if we're already, I, I presume that part of the nutrient release issue might have to do something with population growth, like exceeding old systems for waste management and, and things like that. So, um, I mean, it seems like even though it's billions of dollars for the entire Bay Area to revamp their um, their wastewater treatment facilities, like, I mean, is that kind of inevitable anyway? Like, Shouldn't that be planned for? <laughs> yeah, and it's it's planned for, and some agencies have done it. You know, some are kind of getting close to those values that were kind of proposed in that paper. Like they're making steps towards that. Um, it's just that we didn't get there before we hit this kind of tipping point, right? Um, so it's right. it's kind of it's kind of hard because I feel like things were they're they're starting to move in the right direction, but just not fast enough to avoid the to avoid this event. You know, and so from a policy side, it's hard because you know, it's some, there's some carrot and stick action going on that's taking place. And unfortunately now the big stick comes out because we've, we've lost the carrot, which is, Hey, let's do this before it happens. Right. Um, and so now I think that's, you know, 
from from a public point of view, this is the point where it's time for us now to buckle down and put pressure and say, hey, these decisions need to happen as fast as possible to get the engineering going. Right. And then mitigate mitigation in the meantime. Yep. And so that's like, you know, it's like what Katie's talking about, like Mary, like how can we mitigate these events when they happen in the future? And, you know, all these other communities around the Bay that have marinas, like they're going through this too. Any place that you have water that stays a place a little bit longer than the rest of the Bay is very sensitive to these type of events happening there. And without it happening for the entire Bay, you know, if those nutrient levels are high, you can have small one-offs in places. Um, but my fear is that we will see another SF Bay, whole Bay HAB within the next so five years. Hour after it was actually scheduled to quit, be over, and there's still 70 people left. left. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie and Damon, uh, if possible, I'd like to uh, make arrangements to be uh, to offer the last question for the evening. When we come up, to up, that, up to you guys. I got nothing going on. It's already dark out. Uh, I'm just looking to get away from my cell phone tomorrow and run a mock light up at Sugarloaf with some folks. So up to you. And I'm prepared to wait if there's a couple of others out there. Miss oh, Michelle, Michelle has a, a question. Miss Michelle. Yes, Miss Michelle. Um, having worked for a Contra Costa Water District and knowing that when people water their grass, it goes in the watershed speaking, the fertilizers like run into to the watershed to the yeah. So in the Bay Area, we have Glen Echo, Glen Echo Creek, which runs right behind my house. So everybody that lives in Oakland, when they want when they fertilize their property, grasses and vegetables, there is runoff sometimes. And it, where does it go? Right down to Lake Merritt. There um, you have the it. Thank the you. Question, that's my but, time. But the question is, how much is that compared to the nutrient levels coming in from other sources? Because remember. In the presentation, there was an outline of how much actually enters the bay. 60% is the wastewater, 15% is the urban runoff that you're talking about, sure. and the other 15% is fertilizer coming down out of the delta system from the ag. So people can make changes, um, and we can we can start to wrangle with that that percentage. Uh, but you know, eye on the prize here is that big percentage, that 60%. Yeah. And of course, I was kind of reflecting on an event where um, the the rays were like looking for oxygen coming up from the creeks, from my experience. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And That's my time. <laughs> um, regarding, I, I know that Lake Merritt, whoops, Lake Merritt does uh, receive, uh, there are sewer leaks, let's say, it was a very old system, especially when we have a, a rain event. And I actually did take my students every year to the wastewater treatment plant. And it was, um, it was very smelly and really an eye opener and really quite amazing how they were able to um, remove nutrients from that incredibly rich, dirty water through the action of bacteria really. Um, and it was, um, it was really amazing, but more money needs to be put into upgrading the infrastructure. And unfortunately, um, there are really but real budgetary constraints. We need to get some help for um, for doing this. Um, yeah, uh, to reduce the uh, input of um, you know sewage into the lake through broken pipes and so forth. Yep, there's there's some definite bad pipes. Every time you go there, you're like up. Oh. What am I going to see? What am I going to see? Uh, yep. Okay. How's... Let's see. Okay, I'm going to lower my hand. Um, I'm going to look. Are there more questions? Um, if if we're kind of um, getting towards the end of the hour, uh, we're welcome to stay, and I'm welcome to stay. I mean, I'm happy to stay, and as long as Damon's holding up. Yep. <laughs> And, and just point out because there's a couple questions about this in the chat, yes. like what agencies to talk to. Yeah. I mean, I would start, and this isn't to be to me mean, but start as high up as you can and then work down. Um, so I haven't heard about a federal agency being involved yet, um, but I know State Water Board is starting to get comments in because they actually hosted me on the seventh. And, and I gave a quick five minutes, and they were very receptive to that because they know they knew this problem was coming. Um, 
And I think the more pressure that can be applied there, because they're the ones that get to apply pressure on the agencies beneath them at the local levels. And so if you've got a short amount of time and you want to comment to somebody, that's where I would start right now. That actually speaks to the uh, question that I was going to try to close, close us out with mm -hmm. this evening, which <clears throat> had to do with this. Uh, you mentioned that we are just on the brink of seeing what's going to happen going forward as a result of what is currently happening the fish die off and what the ramifications will be like that going forward. And so I guess what I was wondering, um, when the algae bloom showed up and was first seen and discolored the water, it, it caught the attention of the press and it became a, a, a huge story real quick, uh, even before the fish started to die. Mm -hmm. And so if we're just on the brink of it, do you, could you, would you think that we're going to have potentially more occurrences that will cause that type of immediate press attention mm -hmm. that we could take advantage of uh, if we can, if we can know it's going to happen in advance and be prepared to um, maybe uh, roll out some of the things that we've talked about tonight and get that information out there. Well, uh, so sadly, the press is like um, a student at UC Davis. When they first get there, they they recognize that smell of cattle and stuff. And then after a couple of days, a couple of times, it doesn't bother them anymore. And so my fear is that it will not continue to hit the news after a couple of cycles. And that's why... Right now is the time to exert the pressure, get the wheels moving, get the decisions to get the engineering going that needs to happen now. We don't want to wait for more of these cycles and hoping that the press might run with it more. This is the time now to do the full, full push. Um, and people want it. It's not like these agencies don't want it, right? But they've got a lot else going on. Anybody you know that works in a big agency, right? It's not like, well, I got just this one thing I got to worry about. They have a bazillion things, but what helps focus them is public comment about it. Media helps focus them. So the more you can get this in the media right now, the more public comments can come across waterboards desk, you know, and these other agencies, the quicker we will get to that decision to start the engineering. Okay. Are we already at a point where we can even give the public a, um, <laughs> a goal to comment on uh, or is it just sort of you know, at, this, at this point, you could just call up and be like, hey, I live in this city. I'm concerned about this die off and this algal bloom. How are we getting this under control? I mean, you could start just as simple as that. Just, hey, I am concerned. You don't have to come in with like a here's how I think we're going to solve this. I need to let you know about it. I mean, sheer numbers of people complaining and being worried about the future and asking, what are you doing? Helps focus agencies. You share maybe not now, but when Katie sends out the information from this chat, the contact information for the um, water board so that everyone that's here today will have the information to be able to reach out to them. Yeah, I think that would be the right thing to do. Yeah. yeah oh, there it is in the chat already. If somebody I wants just, to just do it. Just like Thank that. You. I said there Adrian, it is. Adrian's like, I'm on it. <laughs> already already had it up <laughs> well there we and go. I think and I just want to highlight one more time like agencies want to solve this too right we're all in this together we're just helping focus the effort of, of what's really critical so that we don't see this again I know a lot of like you know deep advocate groups like want to get into this like oh we're in this fight we're not in a fight we're just trying to help focus on what a big problem this is and that we want to get this solved sooner rather than later um, Peggy, do you still have a, a comment or question? Are you, are, are you still with us? Yeah, well, mine was pretty general because, I mean, you and Damon do such a phenomenal job of, of teaching us just enough to, or a lot, and we ask more questions. And so this started out as a presentation about data flagellates, and then it turns out this bloom was 
from something very different, but they're both algae. And then I'm looking at algae and what is algae? And it's, I mean, it's vast. I mean, those two things, dinoflagellates and this heterosigma are just two vastly different things, but they're both often algae. So is, is it just a, their niche in the ecosystem that, that makes them that? And are they so different that we, do they have enough similarities that we can tackle these HABs in the same way? Katie, do you want do you want to approach that? Because I've already been like in a in a taxonomic knot just looking at heterosigma because oh, it's, yeah, it's, it is. It, it was like super confusing. <laughs> well, because it's 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 been moved recently, right? And this actually speaks to mm -hmm. all that we don't know about algae. So right now it's projected there's like 30,000 species of algae, but there and that's like the waving the hands, like we kind of think that's what we and like what is algae? Is there even a there definition is, like, of it? It's, for the most part, it's it's these it's a taxonomic lineage of single cell organisms that do photosynthesis, uh, predominantly. Well, except for the ones that are multicells. Well, yeah, no, there's those two. Those I mean, are, it's those are algae, and then these are largely protists. I do believe they're they have um, nuclei and organelles, and they're so they're you know they're um, they're really. Into, I think there's a lot to know about to learn about that we don't know that would be very helpful, and also about the population dynamics of it. You know what what's the next? How's this going to resolve, and why they're doing it um, when they're out there a lot and they don't do it? And there's been nutrients in our bay. There's been a heck of a lot of nutrients in our bay for a very long time and hot temperatures. And you know, I think just the understanding at a basic level would be really helpful. But they, you know, they're photosynthesizing single cell organisms, life forms, um, and they're, they're not really technically algae, uh, but people call them that, but what does it really matter? You know, you can uh, look it up. Um, there's um, Santa Cruz lab that has a really nice, many labs, uh, Smithsonian has labs that will kind of break it down for you as to their relatedness and all. Um, but I think um, it, the different ones could be different in their, in how they, um, they play out their blooms. I always, you know, as an evolutionary biologist, I'm kind of always thinking about, you know, what, what is the advantage? Why is it, why are they doing this now? Um, you know, they're not doing it to bug us. They're doing it for the individual advantage of those organisms over a long period of time. I think that's a fascinating way to look at it that I want to find the answer out to, but maybe that's really academic. Uh, but I think it could actually lead to some interesting you know, when we, and with this species, I mean, there's some really interesting things about it because we know after it goes through the big bloom, when the kind of die off section is starting to happen, it'll go into a cyst state. Yeah. So that way it gets to deposit basically now all across the San Francisco Bay. So you have all of these cysts now basically waiting for when do I get my happy environment again so that I can emerge and start another bloom. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a really, I mean, it's a really great evolutionary strategy. I mean, this. This organism, or what we're calling this organism, right, is kicking butt. It's all over the planet <laughs> having big blooms. Like mm -hmm. evolutionarily, it's very successful at this point. Actually, we should check in with Janai, who's really a plankton specialist. And uh, she's here tonight. Uh, um, Janai, are you able to, to, um, to say something about this? Are you, and she had... She's here. Sorry, no camera. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> So she may not want to. She may want to just put that in chat, or maybe give us a um, some something for the post letter. And that and that might actually be an interesting talk some sometime for a lakeside chat, which is kind of like getting getting to look at that portion of the world. Because we spend a lot of times talking about the macro stuff we can see, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of micro stuff going on at Lake Merritt. That I mean, I like to try yeah. and go there, but I don't know much there, and I would love to learn from other people that know that that arena. Me too. Um, yeah, well, there's several wonderful sources out there that understand or, or have studied um, the ecology of the shorelines of, of the bay, including some of these little byways like we live on. Da but, Damon, would you hazard a guess as to what uh, we may uh, have to report regarding this process at our next Lakeside Chat 30 days from now? <laughs> hazard a guess. Um... I would probably say that we'll see the ramifications of the food web um, destabilization. So I think more disruption to our normal bird behavior um, and out in the San Francisco Bay, disruption to the pinnipeds. Uh, I think we'll see disruption, you know, seal, sea lion behavior, um, which is, I'm hoping against it, 
just like I was hoping against this on August 10th. Um, but, I mean, this is also where it'd be really nice to have an ecologist kind of get into this conversation. Because I mean, most of the people I'm finding out there, you know, are, are, are speaking from a very knowledgeable point about, you know, hydrology, algal blooms, things like that. But I haven't heard like a really kind of well-versed ecologist talk about the entire San Francisco Bay system and the effect. Um, and I think that's the big picture that a lot of us need right now so that we can prepare ourselves for what might happen um, and see, you know, is there things that we can do to help um, as, as a destabilization may take place? I think we have some uh, people on the, uh, you know, that we can ask that would be really great to have their perspectives in the future on a future chat. Okay, can I make this, make this uh, comment? And yes. close this, close this Absolutely, chat. Absolutely, David. No, <laughs> David. Okay, what's going on? Miss Michelle has something to say. Oh, hello, Miss Michelle. Hello. <laughs> I grew up in Southern California, and we had something down there. I was a surfer called the Red Tide. Is that similar? Not similar. It's, it's it's also an algal bloom. It just happens to be usually a different species. I think down in Southern California, in fact. Sadly enough, there's one happening right now. We're seeing dead sea lions or seals show up um, around Long Beach right now. Uh, but no, red... and no dead surfers. No dead surfers, yeah. None yet. You guys, you guys usually try to keep the, the fish and the uh, the water volumes low in the mouth, I hear, but I'm not, I'm not sold on that. Uh, but that usually has demoic acid, or at least that's the one that's, that's the toxin being um, in the red tide right now in Southern California. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay, uh, if unless anyone else has a burning desire, or oh, I have a burning not. question for Janai. Janai, you were telling me we I've been I've been straining about why the red tide is red, and I think we see the tide. The tide in Lake Merritt was rosy, at least it was rosy. So you were telling me that you saw a YouTube um, presentation about that. If you could send that, I would send it on to other people as well. Yeah, yeah. And, I've, and I've heard people call heterosigma uh, a golden tide in, in a way mm -hmm. to differentiate it from the, the red tide. And I think that's there's some nomenclature control problems mm -hmm. going on within biology here. Yeah. Um, and so the way that I'm conceptualizing this is red tides I typically associate with a known toxin mm -hmm. um, that is bad on the toxin side, where heterosigma, I hear people talk about it as a golden tide, where the main thing you're looking at is O2 depletion and maybe a minor neurotoxin event or clogging of gills. Um, but like Janai has pointed out too, red tide, golden tide, they're all old terms for what we're now just calling harmful al algal blooms, the HAB events. And so HAB is a much better kind of catch-all for all of these type of events where we have a large bloom of a photosynthetic organism or non-photosynthetic, I guess, is possible too, um, that then leads to a negative event in that waterway. I would just like to speak for the um, for the um, phytoplankton as well. They are the base of marine ecosystems. Most of them are very good, and even heterosigma may be a good meal when it's not mm -hmm. causing the um, the devastation that it does. So there, we shouldn't not like all of them. And there's yeah. and they're so cool too. I mean, if you were to go out to Lake Merritt, we didn't have this event right now. Mm -hmm. You sample the water. Like the diversity of just the shapes and the way they move, like it is, it's it's very entertaining. I know it sounds weird. I'm, I'm a weirdo. I like <laughs> microscopes and small stuff, but like the diversity that that's there is really amazing. Totally is, and I know you've done this, Damon, as well. That um, we've been doing plankton toes and looking at the uh, microorganisms at a table at Lake Merritt uh, for a number of our um, of our workdays, just to kind of in addition to picking up trash and sweeping and everything, you can really see that everything is connected and that mm -hmm. that's the bottom of the food chain. It's very cool. Very yeah. cool. And it's cool because at Lake Merritt, you can see them them fluctuate over time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and it, it happens relatively quick, which is really cool. It leads you to believe that there's this amazing dynamic action taking place that we all basically don't see just because it's not at our scale. Um, and definitely Lake Merritt, like August through October, it's just that changeover is just so cool. Um, Thank you. Janai, Janai has given us a, a heads up on like what's dominant Lake Merritt right now. I can't even say that word, but I know what that is. And it is one of these ones that is just really cool. They get kind of relatively long and they have kind of very um, extended kind of spines all over them. 
Um, and those are some of the really cool ones that I actually look forward to usually in September mm -hmm. around Lake Merritt. So it sounds like they are there now. Cool. Dinos, dinos or um, uh, Ketoceros? The... Ketoceros, there we go. Yeah. Thanks. Ah. My, my ah. Latin binomials are not great because I say these words to myself and then I'm afraid mm -hmm. to say them in public. <laughs> oh, thank you. So Adrian, Adrian is putting valuable information into the chat, which we'll share with it. Adrian, are you, do you want to um, say Dave. something about it? Uh, it was just a report from a international organization about uh, global problems, sort of similar mm -hmm. to this, uh, just uh, in not just in estuaries, but in the ocean as well, um, and the, you know the formations of dead zones around the world, and sort of comparing different uh, estuaries and places where things have actually gotten better and stuff as well, which is few, so far between, but still there. That is so valuable. So we'll include that in the post letter if I can find it here. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, Damon, yeah. this is Damon, kind of amazing. Damon, 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 you want to ask the, the last, last, last question? Yeah. Well, no, I'm going to make the last comment. Actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, go, go, you go. <laughs> really? Oh, before that, though, Damon, you just said that you have sometimes you're afraid or nervous about saying. Talk. I've never heard so many big scientific words fall out of somebody's mouth. You should see what's going on behind the mouth. Um, but um, I wanted to share something that I find really funny uh, that occurred to me. It was like uh, one of these way back childhood memories. See, because I come to uh, from such a long journey that was so non-scientific and non-environmentalist to uh, arrive here with you this evening. But uh, today I, it occurred to me that uh, I got the most greatest inspiration from the weirdest uh, source, uh, almost even like from an evil source or a, a, a source, uh, what do you call it, a commercial? Anyway, here's, here, here it is, and I'll, I'll leave you guys with this. Um, chiffon margarine, it's good enough to fool mother nature. If you think it's butter, but it's not, it's chiffon. It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I remember that one. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody, Damon. for coming. Remember, it's not nice to fool with Mother Nature. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Perfect so much. Thought. Thanks so much to everybody yeah. and to Damon. And Thank you. Damon, this was great. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, thanks, thank you. Thanks Dave. for having me. And Katie, I'll send you the link for the uh, PowerPoint. So if you do uh, want, you can distribute that out with the with the messaging too. That'd be That'd very be helpful. Thank you so much. We'll All right, everybody. Have, have a, a good great evening. weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you so much. You. Bye, bye. bye. Bye, everybody, and again, thanks. Thanks, Janice, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Damon. Yep. Thank you, Damon. All right. Thanks, so guys, Roston. Bye. Thank you.